Up today, we're excited to welcome a distinguished leader in the marketing consumer goods industry, Tom Gargiulo, Chief Marketing Officer at Body Armor Sports Nutrition. Tom brings a wealth of experience from impactful roles at Danone, Kids, Next, and now Body Armor, where he leads the charge in sports hydration innovation. Tom, so great to see you today. Hey, Matt, how are you? Good. I'm really excited uh, for this chat today. Body Armor is such an interesting brand, and it's been fascinating to see its ascent um, over recent years. But before we dive into Body Armor, we'd love to hear a little bit more about you um, sure. and your journey in the marketing space and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, so I actually have a very, uh, my background is a very non-traditional path uh, to actually where I got to. Um, I went to a very, uh, I went to a small liberal arts school up in New England um, and studied uh, political science, believe it or not. I didn't know if I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know what I wanted to do, uh, but I was really intrigued by the material. But eventually found myself uh, getting involved in the sports industry, uh, doing internships at a couple of teams, uh, a couple of um, websites, you know, back when the uh, dot-com boom was going on. Yeah. Um, and eventually found myself in sports marketing. Um, and my first real job was at the National Football League. You know, started kind of answering phones, doing expense reports, doing your typical admin stuff, but eventually, you know, fought my way into meetings and um, got involved in, in kind of the business dealings and eventually worked on a lot of big accounts like PepsiCo, uh, Campbell Sioux. Managing um, sponsorships. Managing, sp selling and managing sponsorships, exactly. Um, and that ultimately kind of gave me the knack for uh, CBG and, and marketing. Um, so I decided to go back to business school, get my MBA at Emory University, um, where I actually got like formal business training. Um, and uh, eventually found my way uh, to Frito-Lay in Plano, Texas. And uh, that's where I really started my brand marketing career. Eventually found myself moving to Denone, um, you know, because I was getting homesick uh, down in Texas. I'm from the New York area and started to do a lot of different experiences, not only in marketing, but also in sales um, and just gave me a very great perspective around how to manage a business and, and how to be a general manager. Um, spent almost 10 years at, at Denone, uh, had some fantastic um, experiences there, and then landed at Kind uh, right before Kind actually was acquired by Mars um, and led, so, led marketing function there, led the commercial strategy functions, um, and uh, ultimately helped Kind get fully sold to Mars um, you know, by the time I left for, for a pretty healthy multiplier, especially yeah. during COVID, which was incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Difficult. I remember that. Um, yeah. Uh, so did that. And then ultimately landed at a, another small up and, uh, up and coming, uh, brand called Nix, where I actually dipped my toes into being a chief operating officer, uh, and kind of learned, you know, how to start a line, purchase a line, you know, do all manage a co-manufacturer. Uh, and did that, but then I got a call from the CEO here at Body Armor, who was a close friend of mine, and um, you know it was the perfect opportunity for me because it marries my passion of, of brand right. marketing and, and sports. Coming um, full circle, right? Exactly. And uh, now I'm on cloud nine. Couldn't be happier to be here. That's awesome. Well, thanks for running us through that. I want to just double click on a couple of things you had mentioned yeah. as you were going over your background. First and foremost, you know, getting a job to work at the NFL. As a, as a young professional, especially yeah. as a sports fan, which it's clear you are after you know going through your background, it's probably such an incredible thrill, but it's also probably not an easy thing to do. And then you went on to talk about how after you got the job there, you kind of forced your way into meetings and, and, and basically yeah. took the job versus being asked for it. And for some of our younger listeners, just walk us through that journey and what were some of your learnings in terms of what worked to break into a dream job and not only get the job, but also kind of mold it into your own and, and make it more impactful as your job progressed? Yeah, I mean, to your point, it's, it's definitely, it was a job that was more focused on the passion than on the monetary benefits. Um, I had to bartend on the weekends for, for four and a half years while, while I was uh, working there, um, you know, just to, to pay my rent and, and to do, you know, the things that typical 20-some-year-olds 20, 20 olds do. Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, ultimately I landed there. I knew that's where I wanted to be and I was able to get there. Um, and I didn't care what I had to do. Um, I started it, you know, really as an admin for a couple of managers in the sponsorship group. 
um, you know, answering phone calls, doing their expense reports, um, you know, doing the, 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 the kind of the basics. But, you know, eventually I, I, my goal was to try to convince them that I had more to offer. Yeah. Um, and over time, you know, as I asked for more and more projects, they started to feel more and more confident in my abilities and, and ultimately gave me a couple of shots. And, you know, that, that ultimately got me in the conference rooms and, and uh, ultimately got me a seat at the table. And yeah, I think so many me. people make the mistake of just waiting to be told what to do. Exactly. And I think, it, it, you know, that's akin to just coloring just inside the lines when you're a student. I mean, if you follow orders, fine, you might kind of move along. But this world is made for people who go out and grab things and not for people who wait to be told what to do. And I think you also the other thing that's not lost on me is in this world where so many young people, I think, are just so ready to flex their new watch or a new car. Like the reality is sometimes you do have to become a bartender when you want to work your dream job exactly. and that's okay. That's kind of how you get to where you want to get to. And I just think it's a, it's a good message. The world was different back then as it is today. We just, yeah. we both came out in the workforce around the same time. Now I think there's far less patience and people want to hit it right away. And they don't understand that you have to take your chops along the way and learn your lessons to get to where you want to get to. Absolutely. Um, you know, I grew up in a very, in an entrepreneurial environment. My dad was an entrepreneur and, you know, I knew, you know, learning from him, hard work is, is going to get you where you need to get to. Yeah. Yeah. You can be, you can be savvy, you can be intelligent, but unless you work very hard, you're not going to, so you're not going to end up where you need to get to. So that was kind of the mantra I always held close to my heart. Absolutely. So you also mentioned that when you're working at Kind, um, which, you know, was acquired by Mars and obviously a great yeah. success story, you know, they were, it was in the midst of the acquisition. Talk to us about what it's like to work and the emerging CPG startup as yeah. they're getting acquired by a behemoth like Mars. Like what were some of the considerations you had to have as a leader to keep people focused and also deal with um, a huge financial transaction at the same time? Yeah, so, you know, during that time, I, I, what, I, what I loved about my time at Kind was, you know, I really got a taste for what that kind of up and coming startup CPG experience was like, um, where frankly, it's, you, you don't lean on you know, mountains and mountains, mountains of research. You don't lean on, you know, a playbook of how to do things. You don't lean on a ton of people around you that have, you know, a ton of experience um, in, in certain functions. So, you know, for me, it was it was a great opportunity to kind of learn skill sets that I didn't have before, um, become much more entrepreneurial, become much more self-sufficient actually developed the people around me. And in many cases, a lot of those people were, were, were very young, very malleable, didn't have a whole lot of experience. Um, and it really kind of tested me as, as not only a marketer, a marketer, but also a leader. Yeah. Um, but what I loved the most about it was, you know, there was a direct correlation between the effort and the success that you had and, you know, the, the financial results at the end of the acquisition. So, that was one of the one of the things that I loved the most. Like everybody at that company was so focused on you know the 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 end game and getting to that finish line with Mars. Um, we did some extraordinary things, launching a ton of new products. You know, expanding kind to new categories, launching new go to markets, um, and doing so many different unique things. Um, and we were able to cross that finish line and show Mars truly what the value that kind had to bring to their portfolio. Absolutely, it's such a unique product, the way that it's designed, we can see the ingredients, you know, the exactly. way it's packaged and, and merchandised, you know, because it's a competitive category. We're gonna get into your category as yeah. well, which is also competitive. And event, you know, you need a lot of different things to succeed in terms of differentiation. Obviously the product's gonna taste good and has to have a good shelf life and you have to have a good message, but the packaging and, and the way the product looks and feels I would imagine was a huge part of the success of kind. Would you agree? And what, and oh, absolutely. Kind of yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think, you know, uh, Daniel Lebetsky, the founder of kind, um, he's a brilliant entrepreneur, um, you know, and a little bit crazy times, but certainly one of the most brilliant people I've worked with. I mean, his whole, his whole, you know, focus was, delivering a fantastic tasting product and being as transparent with consumers as they possibly can. Right. And he put a heavy focus also on where the product was sold as well. So getting into airports, getting into bodegas, getting into, 
you know, not maybe not the most, you know, uh, widely available grocery store, but maybe the most prestigious. So you can kind of carry that premium badge. Yeah. Um, and he was ruthless. I mean, down to the point where he would do it himself if he saw an opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, that that kind of that's the kind of culture he built. And that's the experience all of us had. Absolutely. So you went on to join Body Armor in March of 2023. What some yeah. people might not know is two years earlier than that, um, late November um, 2021, I should say, the early November 2021, um, Coca-Cola acquired or finished their acquisition yeah. of Body Armor. It was for $5.6 billion. It was the largest ever brand acquisition. Um, another quick factoid there is Kobe Bryant has actually made an investment yeah. seven years prior in Body Armor, the late, great Kobe Bryant in 2014. Obviously, that was... Um, a brilliant move by, by Kobe. Um, and it was in that age when athletes were starting to invest in, um, you know, in, in brands, you know, we, we know that Powerade was one of the first brands that saw, um, outside investment from, uh, and vitamin water as well for, from athletes and celebrities and things of that nature. So when you joined body armor in 2023, what was it like? Because at that point, the company had already been acquired by, yeah. you know, so, so, so they're acquired by Coca-Cola. Are you operating inside Coca-Cola? Are you still kind of a, a separate entity? And I guess what were some of the nuances given that situation? Yeah, so it was a very interesting time kind of in the life cycle of Body Armor where we were going through a bit of a transition. You know, a lot of the old guard started to leave the organization. As often happens, right? Post that. Yeah, as often, it, yeah. Exactly. It's a natural progression. I mean, you know, they a lot of people made some really great money and and decided that hey maybe they either want to do something completely different or maybe try that, try to throw their hat in the ring again. Of course. Um, and uh, you know, so it required us to do a lot of uh, recruiting and and to start bringing people on into the organization that had different experiences and different skill sets that we didn't necessarily have in the past. Um, you know, this this company was born. You know, through again, the by a, a brilliant entrepreneur who, you know, learned so many different things from his experiences at Vitamin Water and Pirates Booty and a bunch of other companies, um, and built this brand to where it is today. But, you know, now we've grown to over a billion dollar brand. We have to kind of it takes a different set of skills and and, and different type of individuals in order to get it to that two billion dollar number, three billion, four billion, et cetera. Um, you know, so when I joined, uh, we had to fill a lot of holes and and I was very fortunate to to keep some of the best um, that uh, that stayed around from the acquisition. And we brought in some really, really sharp people. And um, over the last year and a half, it's been, you know, slowly but surely integrating kind of into the Coke system in certain places but still very much keeping our own identity and keeping our own unique culture here in, in, uh, in Whitestone, Queens. And, and what are some of the benefits to being part of the broader Coca-Cola organization? I would imagine there's many, but you know, yeah. like what, what, what are you able to tap into that you wouldn't be able to um, if you were just a, still a standalone startup? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a bunch of things. I mean, first and foremost, the muscle that Coca-Cola brings um, into the store. I mean, it's it's bar none the best in the business. Distribution, um, basically. Distribution is 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 absolutely second to none. Um, you know, the thousands of employees that that stack the cases on the floor, put the bottles in the cooler. You know, put the cases in on the shelf. I mean, we have the best in the business. So having that that strength behind our distribution was a huge reason why we went from. You know, a two hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred fifty million dollar brand to a five hundred million dollar brand to a billion dollar brand, in only a a few years. Now, in addition to that, um, you know, Coca Cola has some of the most brilliant marketers in the world. You can argue that some of the best, you know, marketing campaigns in the history of um, of CPG have, have come out were born out of this organization. So, Absolutely. you know, being able to tap into a lot of that expertise, being able to tap into a lot of the resources and insights that, that um, Coca-Cola has to offer. Um, you know, it's, it, it's been just an absolute um, uh, wealth of, of resources that we, we can now tap into that we never had before. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 
there's certain things that, you know, processes and protocols that we have to follow now that we're part of a publicly traded company. But, you know, on the flip side, the very much, especially Jennifer Mann and her, and her direct reports and our CEO Fed, you know, have given us the ability to, to kind of continue to stand um, on our own, tap into Coca-Cola in the places where we need it um, and can leverage it, um, but still maintain our own unique identity. Yeah. And, and when you look at the category, I guess the category is a sports hydration category, I'm sure you probably call it yeah. something. But so, so what are the what are the major consumer behaviors and trends that are driving the category uh, that make you continue to have to innovate to, to stay on top and be in a growth position? Yeah. So the, the last couple of years has, has been really interesting in, in the category here in the U.S., especially, um, you know, it's not often that you get to work in an industry where there's this behemoth that has a 65 percent market share. I mean, right. I was on the flip side when I worked at Frito-Lay and Salty Snacks. Um, so I kind of got that experience, but I've never been, you know, at such a coming from such a um, a unique place versus a behemoth like that. Um, so you're always going to have Gatorade and and the big dollars that they bring to the table and you know the the expertise that they have in the category and the science behind um, you know the the category. You always have to kind of keep up with them. So that that's kind of the first area that 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 keeps us on our toes. The second is you know we have a lot of players coming in onto the scene, you know, last year or the year before Prime came onto the scene and you know, basically copied our product and, you know, brought their own spin to it with content creators, et cetera. Right. That was um, so, Logan Paul's brand, right? Yeah, Logan Paul's yeah. brand. Exactly. So, you know, that wasn't necessarily a product fight. It was more of a marketing fight and an eyeballs fight. And now we have a brands like Electrolit coming onto the scene where they're delivering unique functionality that, that this category hasn't really seen before in terms of rapid rehydration. So, you know, what, what keeps us on our toes, you know, are those three things. I mean, from one end, it's the science um, and, and the mass availability and, and the, the support that PepsiCo brings behind Gatorade. It's, you know, these up and comer, what we call ankle biters uh, coming at our heels. And a lot yeah. of them are, are just copycats of us. And then we have um, brands like Electrolyte coming onto the scene and, and bringing unique and different experiences and, and functional benefits to the, to the category. Yeah. And, and one thing I know that has been a big initiative as of late, we talked earlier about packaging, is that Body Armor has rolled out limited edition collector bottles. Yes. Um, you know, yeah. which, you know, obviously you're probably well aware of just the collectibles market right now. Uh, the big, you know, collector collectors conference last week was the national and Chicago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fanatics has their own conference coming up in August. So, you know, you're well aware of just the fanaticism in the sports space. And it seems like you're tapping into that, which I think is a brilliant yeah. strategy. Walk me through how, you know, you came to that and, and how you're activating on that. So first, I, I am going to admit I, I am a an avid collector um, Me too. <laughs> of sport cards and sports memorabilia. So yeah, I, I was very I had a lot of FOMO not being at the national last week. Um, but uh, you know, one of the the biggest one of the most valuable assets we have uh, within Body Armor is Team Body Armor. Um, you know, we have some of the the biggest and best stars in in their respective sports, and you know, thinking through. Our, our marketing plan, you know, we wanted to find unique ways of us connecting Team Body Armor with our consumers. Um, you know, so we, we brought, you know, fresh thinking uh, to the table. We were able to do some unique things on social media. We were able to do some unique things uh, through our field marketing organization. Um, but one of the biggest opportunities that we, that we identified was just how do we start connecting our, our athletes to our product itself? Yeah. Um, and, you know, playing off the, the, the fanatical um, uh, nature of, of fans in certain markets and, and, you know, unlocking the ability to kind of give them something unique um, was really interesting for us. And then, you know, we kind of took it a step further by integrating unique content with each one of our bottles with augmented reality, um, which, you know, uh, we got some really great feedback from our consumers about. So, um, you know, more to come in this space. I think maybe this year we were a little bit too aggressive in terms of the number of, of bottles that we've done. Um, 
but we certainly got some key learnings, and, and we're going to be coming out full guns blazing in 2025 and six. It's all awesome. really exciting stuff. And when you roll that out, like a collector's edition bottling, like how does that work in terms of you know, like a scalable distribution platform? Because I would imagine it's hard for you to slot in all these limited edition, yeah. edition models when you're kind of working on mass scale distribution. Yeah. So one of the unique, um, I guess, challenges slash benefits of working for a company like Coca-Cola um, and having the, the sales organization and the, and the in-store muscle that we have you're, you're always constantly not only fighting against your com competition, you're also fighting against your sister brands. Right. Air of mind. So a lot of it has to do with internal selling and getting our bottling network and our associates excited about, you know, what we have to offer. So we put a, a great amount of um, effort into, you know, internal selling and making sure that we're getting all of the associates super excited about it. Then obviously we have the customer, which is another key st stakeholder that we have to, you know, get it, get excited about it. And then the last piece is obviously the and most important is obviously the consumer. So, yeah. you know, we, we take this kind of three pronged approach with every major initiative we do um, to make sure that we have, you know, a high likelihood of success in the market. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on to just communications and marketing. Obviously, the world's changed. We have AI now, which is reframing everything in terms of the way that we go to market. What are some of the tactics that you've used from a marketing and media standpoint to get the message out to your core consumer and break through the, the increasing clutter that we're seeing um, you know, in the consumer marketing world? Yeah. Um, artificial intelligence is, is, is certainly um, a buzzing topic right now. And I yeah. think, you know, it's going to be survival of the fittest of who's going to embrace it and capitalize on that technology uh, sooner than later. Uh -huh. And you're going to see brands, you know, hopefully like ours, who are going to kind of take it to the next level and, and you know, uh, exploit some of the greatest benefits of it. Um, and then you're going to see brands kind of stick to their guns and, and do what they traditionally do. And they're probably going to find themselves very far behind very fast. You know, so... In, in terms of artificial intelligence, I mean, our, our brand is, is a, a, a better for you, you know, um, real, super transparent, you know, brand similar to what we just talked about with Kind. So when it comes to, you know, certain marketing tactics and things like that, I don't necessarily know if artificial intelligence is the best way for us to con connect with our consumers. Um, but on the back end, when it comes to you know, making sure that we're serving up content that is most relevant for our consumers, making sure that we're, you know, tapping into conversations that um, are naturally connected with our product and people's passion points um, are great ways for us to leverage this technology. And, you know, from a social, digital and a media perspective, it's going to be a big part of our approach in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be fascinating as the hour all develops. So. Uh, shifting gears, you know, as we wrap up here, Tom, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your day as CMR sure. of such a fun brand, how you spend your time, what's the pie chart of your day look like, and what are some of the things that you do personally to make sure that you're continuing to progress and develop um, as a CMO? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, so first and foremost, the one thing that you can ask anybody on my team is that I travel a ton. Um, you know, not only uh, do we have, we obviously report to the Coca-Cola um, company uh, down in Atlanta, but we have over 65 bottlers across the country that manage and service our product on a daily basis. So, you know, um, a good portion of my, my time is actually spent on the road talking to these bottlers and trying to communicate the marketing plans that we're putting together and try to create that excitement around the programs that we want to execute. Um, but when it comes time in, in the office, you know, I spend a great amount of time, you know, connecting directly with my, my team, uh, my direct report. So I spend a, a, probably about, you know, anywhere between a quarter to a third of my day, um, you know, making sure that they have the resources they need, the support and direction and guidance that they need. Um, and then the rest of the day, it's, it's, it's a handful of other meetings, either part of our leadership team meeting. Uh, with our CEO and his direct reports, um, or you know, being in a number of initiative meetings, you know, talking about projects or talking about 
you know, campaigns, things of the like, um, and, and trying to, you know, drive the business forward and, and create that growth that we need. Yeah. And obviously you wouldn't be able to create that growth on your own. You obviously have to yeah. delete the team. And so when you look at building a team, what are some of the things that you look for when you, when adding people to your team to make sure that you can compete at the highest level? Yeah. So I'm a little bit biased in terms of maybe the profile of people that I'm looking for. Um, you know, again, because I grew up, uh, with a, uh, a serial entrepreneur as a father. Um, so work ethic is a big part uh, of what I look for. You know, the people that are willing to put in the time, the people that are willing to put in the hours, you know, um, obviously not crossing boundaries into personal time and stuff, but right. you know, making sure that every minute that they're focused on work, that they're focused and, and committed to tr driving what we need. Um, the second is, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm very passionate about is empowerment um, and making sure that I bring on a team that's, you know, highly self-sufficient. Um, you know, they can obviously tap into me and any of the leaders in the organization when needed, but I'm going to give them um, the space in order to succeed or fail and then hopefully learn from that. So, you know, for me, it's, it's hardworking, self-sufficient, and, you know, last but not least, it's, uh, the individuals that just want to win, you know, yeah. like you said before, we're in a highly competitive market. We have a massive behemoth as, as our primary competitor. And we got a bunch of these ankle biters kind of coming after us, uh, and trying to mimic a lot of the stuff that body armor has done over the years. Um, and you know, I, I like to surround my, myself with people who want to win, who aren't afraid of overcoming the behemoth, who aren't afraid of, of leaving those ankle biters in the dust, um, and ultimately winning in the marketplace. I think it's really well said. So to wrap up here, Tom, I mean, obviously you've had a really exciting career and I can't wait to see where you're going to take the body armor brand to next. When you look back mm -hmm. at your career journey, what were some of the things that you think you did right along the way to put yeah. yourself in the CMO seat today? Yeah. So I, like I, like I told you, I, I, I had a little bit of a, a unique uh, career path, so I wouldn't exactly call a cookie cutter, uh, from most a CMO. Most right? Yeah. Most aren't. Um, one of the things that I did, which I thought really helped me in the long run was I took on a lot of assignments that, you know, some were unplanned, some were planned, but that ultimately pulled me out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, I, I go back to my time at, you know, Den Own or even Kind. Um, the business had different needs than, than maybe what the scope of my current job was. And, you know, I knew that I had value to deliver in other parts of the organization. So I took a leap of faith and, you know, I, I did a few years in category management and, and was the lead of ca the category management organization. You know, spent a few years in, in uh, sales planning where I managed a trade budget and, and built uh, trade plans. Um, spent some time in revenue growth management and, you know, figuring out pricing and, and all these different components. Um, you know, the role I had before I joined Body Armor, I was a chief operating officer at a small startup. Um, all of these experiences and all of these skill sets that I've kind of built along the way have given me such a unique perspective and point of view on the business. Um, that makes me, you know, uh, a business builder versus, you know, somebody who's exclusively focused on, you know, uh, driving one right. respective area of the business. Everything that I look at is through the lens of what's going to be the best for, for the overall health of the business. Um, and that will help guide, you know, ultimately our actions. Absolutely. So to finish up here, Tom, is there a, a quote or mantra that you like to live by? You seem to be super focused on surrounding yourself with winners and, I love that mentality and it's not lost on me that, you know, you are an industry that largely plays in the sports world. So yeah. and, you know, there's a lot of analogies there. I use sports analogies all the time as I'm sure you do in business, but is there any other mantra that you like to live by when you think about your career? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, you know, I, this is going to seem like, uh, like a loaded answer, uh, but I'm going to say the Mamba mentality. Uh, I mean, love it. Kobe was a, a huge part of, of how this brand, um, got to be or it was. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, he was all about making, you know, today better than tomorrow. You know, how can I do the little things better? And over time, those little things add up and ultimately get you to the peak of your game. Um, and, you know, it's, it's truly inspiring. It's a big part of the culture that we've built here at Body Armor, and it will be, you know, moving forward. That's awesome. 
Well, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to share your journey and the current work you're doing with Body Armor. It's super exciting, and I've long been a huge fan of the brand and your work, so it's been a great thrill for me to, um, to connect today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate the time. Absolutely. On behalf of Susie and Adwee Keen, thanks again to Tom Gargiulo, CMO of Body Armor Sports Nutrition, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. The Speed of Culture is brought to you by Susie as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and AGAS Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for The Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.